My name is Chris Norland, and I survived a plane crash as a baby. I was born at the end of the Vietnam War. I don't have a birthday, so I don't really know exactly when I was born. Americans know that there were 56,000 GI deaths in the war, but what the Americans don't talk about is there were as many as 3 million Vietnamese killed in the war. As a result of that, there were as many as a million orphans, and I was one of them. The only paperwork that I had was a little 3x5 card that said the name of my orphanage. So I always knew it was Sanctum Maria Orphanage in Saigon, and there were three names on the card. However, because I don't speak Vietnamese, I, I never really knew what the names meant. Later in life, I was able to contact one of the nuns in my orphanage. She told me that 90% of the children died in my orphanage, so I'm really lucky to be alive. Because it was at the end of the war, there wasn't enough food, water, and in fact, we didn't even have enough diapers, so they put us in buckets for most of the day. The one thing that the nurse told me was that every orphan was loved in the orphanage, and it's something I always remember that she told me. After President Nixon resigned, the North Vietnamese decided to attack and take over the entire country. And the Americans weren't gonna fight anymore. Essentially, the war was over from the Americans' perspective. It was now President Ford, and he asked the American Congress to get money for what's called Operation Baby Lift. Operation Baby Lift was a series of airlifts in April 1975. It brought 3,300 Vietnamese orphan children to countries like the USA, Australia, Canada, and France. Although the official number says 3,300 children, no one knows for sure exactly how many children were evacuated. This was evacuation at the end of the war, so it was very chaotic. For whatever reason, I was put on the first plane out. It was a C-5A Galaxy, which at the time was the largest airplane in the world. The really big cargo planes, the one you see in the movies, the one you can drive a jeep on into. Because I was a baby, they put me in a shoebox and they put that on the airplane passenger seat, seat belted us in. Our plane took off from Tamsin Airport. There were over 300 people on the plane, about 280 passengers and 30 crew members. After a few minutes in the air, there was a malfunction on the plane and the rear cargo doors blew and all the people in the lower half of the plane just fell to their deaths. Because I was young, I was in the upper half of the plane and therefore I survived. After we lost power, the pilots tried to regain control and so they ended up speeding up the plane and they turned around and crashed into a rice field. The plane skidded for about a quarter of a mile and then skipped up back in the air and then crashed into a dike. We were full of fuel and the plane exploded into four parts and everything caught on fire. The plane was about a mile from the road, so when the Americans sent in the rescue jeeps, they had to walk really far across the rice field. And the helicopters arrived, but they couldn't land, and so they would hover above us. There was just smoke and fire everywhere. So they would lower one rescue worker at a time, rescue one person, and bring him back up in a basket. But the, because the rescue operation was slow, some people actually survived the crash, but either burned to death or drowned in the mud. About 176 people survived the crash, and about 138 children and crew members were lost. Those of us that survived the crash were flown to the United States. This crash was the largest loss of life in Defense Intelligence Agency history until 9-11. When I arrived in the USA, even though I was here, I still didn't have a country. South Vietnam didn't exist anymore, and the Americans didn't make me a citizen. I didn't have any paperwork, so it was actually really difficult to prove that I existed. All I had was my little 3x5 card that said I was from St. Maria Orphanage. After living seven years in the USA, and I actually don't even know how old I am because I don't have a birthday, I was eligible though to apply for US citizenship. So I went down to the courthouse and I swore to be an American like all the other immigrants. I had to miss a day of school. The next day at school, my teacher said, what did you do? And I said, I became an American. And I remember really clearly this little girl walks to the front of the room and reads me a welcome to America speech. And every kid in my grade made me welcome to America cards and crayon, you know, Statue of Liberty and the immigrants on boats. And this is what America is to me. After the events of 9-11, I joined the United States Navy to be a pilot. 
Growing up in the USA, people would always tell me that I was lucky to be here and lucky to be alive. And in my head, the way they make you feel is that America is the best place in the world and all the other countries are not any good. So I always felt like I was from a bad place. I felt like I was from a place where Americans got killed. Vietnam was never a place that was a good place. When I was in the military and I would meet Vietnam veterans, they were actually my flight surgeons and they would look at my charts and they would see that I was from Saigon and they'd always ask me about that. And I always felt shame because I didn't know much about my country. The thing that they always tell me is that Vietnam is a really beautiful country. You know, for years, everyone would always ask me if I would want to go back and things like that. And it just always seemed so far away. It seemed like another world. Like many people, I was lucky enough to find someone to get married to. My wife was a Korean national, and so I actually flew back to Korea to meet the family. And while I was in Korea, we were actually close enough to go to Vietnam. So my you know, then fiance, now my wife, we went to Vietnam for the very first time, and I just, I fell in love. It was beautiful. People looked like me, which I'd never seen before. When I arrived at the Saigon airport, it was Tan San Nut, which was the same airport that my plane back in 1975 had left from. The motion was, was really overwhelming, and the humidity. <laughs> I knew I had returned home. One of the things about being in Vietnam and being in Saigon that's different than being in the USA is everybody knows about the plane crash and everyone knows about people like me. One of the things I wanted to do was see if I could find my orphanage. And so I did some Googling and things because I knew the name of the orphanage and I found the address. And as it turns out, my orphanage was in the same neighborhood that I chose my apartment. It was different than what I had imagined. The place just felt like, just felt like there was love there. And I, I understand now when the nuns said that they loved every one of us. And I, and I felt that when I was there. You know, people always ask me if I want to find my parents or find my family, and it's I've come to accept that I don't have anyone. When I discovered the location of my orphanage, there was a little bit of hope that maybe I could find my parents or something. And, you know, I had read stories and, and things where, you know, sometimes these places have like a book where they have all the records and, you know, when we get to the orphanage and we find out the orphanage closed and there was no office anymore and, and there's no book and I just kind of accept that, you know, maybe I'll never know. Emotionally, 2019 was, was a really high for me. 2020 though comes and you know, my wife is a Korean national and the immigration office was closed last year. So I returned to the USA to try to facilitate my wife's green card. I haven't seen my wife since December 2019. This year in 2020, I just do everything I can to spread positivity. I started a podcast called Bluer Sky, and the idea is that not only is tomorrow going to be a blue sky day, something positive, it's going to be bluer than you could ever imagine. Because of where I came from and because of the way I grew up, I never look down on anyone and I, I never make fun of anyone because I, I know that a lot of good people in the world can come from any background. Because I don't have any family, I find myself reaching out to people all the time to develop relationships and share as many positive messages as I can because I, I feel that we can rely on each other and support each other through these tough times.